welcome to another edition of the Left Hand Path. Here we discuss issues and topics relating to metaphysics, astrology, and astrotheology. The word sinister comes from the Latin for left hand, with a basic understanding of Kabbalah and astrological principles. We can shed light on the occult forces underpinning the globalization project, exposing its sinister progression towards the left hand path. In the beginning was the word Logos. And the word Logos was with God, and the word Logos was God. John 1, 1 From a metaphysical astrological perspective, the Logos can be viewed as universal consciousness, whereas the physical realm, including the planets within our solar system, are various expressions of that consciousness. Although the physical material realm has limitations within the fabric of time and space, the spiritual realm and the Logos do not. They are timeless and limitless, regarded as an endless sea of profound possibility. Logos comes from a Greek word which can be translated as word reason, speech, opinion, and discourse. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus 535-475 BC used the term Logos to mean order and knowledge. He saw it as the logic behind an argument or persuasive rhetoric. Greek sophists who were philosophical orators and public speakers, used the word to mean discourse. Aristotle used it when referring to the argument or reasoned discourse. The common theme regarding the use of the word Logos points to it being used to express higher levels of conscious awareness, even godlike with infinite potential of knowledge and wisdom. Stoic philosophers in Athens during the 3rd century BC linked the term Logos to a divine animating principle which spread throughout the whole universe. In Christianity, the Logos is also used as a name or title for Jesus Christ which makes sense from a metaphysical perspective because Jesus or Jupiter Zeus represents the crescent of spirituality over the cross of materialism. Coincidentally, Jupiter has a higher resonant frequency than Saturn. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6 Aristotle divided any form of rhetoric into three basic components. In his day, astrology and metaphysics played a major role as the benchmark for understanding their conscious relationship to the universe together with their view of the triad of consciousness. He described all forms of rhetoric as having the logos, logical reason, the ethos, character, and the pathos, emotion. Philo 20 BC to 50 AD, a Hellenized Jew, used the term logos to mean an intermediary divine being or demiurge. Philo followed the platonic distinction between imperfect matter 
and perfect form, and therefore intermediary beings were necessary to bridge the enormous gap between God and the material world. The Logos was the highest of these intermediary beings and was called by Philo, the firstborn of God. Philo also wrote that the Logos of the living God is the bond of everything, holding all things together and binding all the parts, and prevents them from being dissolved and separated. In sunny Islam, the Logos was viewed as the intellect, the universal man, the word of God, and the Mohammedan light. In Islamic mysticism, known as Sufism, both Jesus and Muhammad are seen as the personification of the Logos. From an astrological perspective, the Logos consciousness interacts with both our physical biology through the soul and our subconscious through the spirit. Consequently, the planets within the solar system express various aspects of that Logos energy through their own triad of consciousness, influencing us on multiple levels as they move majestically throughout their orbits, interacting with one another while transiting the Earth. When analyzing the lion-faced serpent picture of the Demiurge, it holds many esoteric secrets. The lion in front of the sun could represent the focal consciousness or soul placed on top of a serpent's body. As nocturnal feeders, serpents have for thousands of years been used to represent the spiritual aspect of consciousness. So here we have the soul taking precedence over the spirit, an inversion of the human relationship with the Logos or the Christ, where the spirit has priority over the material realm and the soul. Another way to view it would be to say the smaller material mind of the focal awareness takes precedence over the larger emotional and spiritual subconscious, limiting interaction with divine potential. On the serpent's left-hand side, we see a six-pointed star, which could represent the planet Saturn. On the right side is the symbol for the moon, Sin. In many schools of philosophy, the Demiurge is viewed as a craftsman or artisan-like character, responsible for fashioning and maintaining the physical material universe. The Demiurge is seen as a separate entity from the Logos or the Creator. In many Gnostic traditions, the material universe is considered as evil, overseen by a malevolent demiurge, whereas the non-material or spiritual world is considered as good. The demiurge is thought to act as a channel for the Logos consciousness, as a mechanism to devolve pure spirit into matter, the consequence of which is thought to manifest in perfections as the Logos consciousness interacts with the human collective, both on a focal and subconscious level. Marcionism, which was an early form of Christianity, believed that the God of the Old Testament was a tyrant or a demiurge, 
a lower entity than the God of the New Testament. Consequently, they rejected the Old Testament altogether. According to the Gnostics, the Demiurge was able to endow man only with psyche, sensuous soul. Only the true God could add the penuma, or the rational soul. This is the feminine aspect of the spirit. The Greek term penuma, often associated with the Holy Spirit of the New Testament. The Gnostics identified the Demiurge with the Jehovah of the Hebrews. In philosophy, the term is used to denote a divine being that is the builder of the universe rather than its creator. Columbia Encyclopedia, 6th edition. In Psalms 82.1, in the NET Bible, it talks about God meeting with an assembly of other gods. God stands in the assembly of El. In the midst of the gods, he renders judgment. Psalms 82.1 El is the Hebrew name for the God of Israel. The theological position of the Tanakha is that the names El and Elohim when used in the singular to mean the supreme God refer to Yahweh beside whom other gods are supposed to be either non-existent or insignificant. In Psalms 82 it suggests that God stands in the assembly of the God of Israel. Could this mean that the Logos has an assembly with the Demiurge in the midst of other gods? Could those gods be aspects of planetary consciousness within our own solar system? The above picture of the Demiurge stands between the moon and a six-pointed star, often representing the planet Saturn. Is it the case that the influence of the Demiurge is felt most strongly through some form of connection with the energetic characteristics of Saturn and the Moon, both planets which play leading roles in the religion of Judaism? At the end of World War II, in 1945, 13 ancient Gnostic books, thought to be from the 3rd or 4th century AD, were discovered in caves near the city of Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt. The leather-bound papyrus books, found by local farmers, became one of the most important archaeological finds concerning early Christianity and Gnostic beliefs ever to be discovered. Also known as the Gnostic Gospel, the books include the Gospel of Thomas, the Secret Book of John, and the Gospel of Truth. Early Gnosticism morphed out of ancient Judaism, with Jewish Gnosticism beginning years before Christian Gnosticism. Gnostics believed that the material realm was evil, ruled by a demiurge, while the spiritual realm was all good, ruled by a divine cosmic consciousness. The important aspect of the Nag Hammadi texts is the creation of man's story, which was altered by Christianity to fit their new post-Gnostic perspective. The texts explain the creation story as follows. Life originated from the core of our galaxy, a central core of pure light, which was the home of divine spiritual consciousness 
26,500 light years away from the Earth, a number which also resembles the great year of astrological precession of the equinoxes. The Gnostics believed the galactic centre, which they called the Pleroma, was alive. They thought that matter, like stars and planets, did not exist in the central core, a core inhabited by pure spiritual beings, like torrents of energy, which they called aeons, Gnostic word for gods. They saw it as a balanced core of both male and female aeons, whirling around like serpents in an ocean of conscious light, similar to the yin and yang symbolic expression of balanced dualistic monism. From this central core, the galaxy spiralled outwards, forming four galactic arms of progressively denser matter. Our solar system is situated 26,500 light years out on the third galactic arm. These galactic limbs provide almost infinite opportunity for galactic consciousness to express itself in a variety of material forms. When the eons within the Pleroma had a thought, which they wanted to manifest into matter, they would send out an extension of plasmatic light outward from the centre to a suitable place along one of many galactic arms. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Genesis 1, 1 The Gnostics concluded that thoughts from the core which manifested along the galactic arms were left to their own devices, to evolve like a divine cosmic experiment, without the day-to-day -day control of the eons. The Gospel of Philip says that the world was created as a mistake or anomaly. The world came about through a mistake, for he who created it wanted to create it imperishable and immortal. He fell short of attaining his desire. The Gnostic creation story suggests that the earth came into existence through the independent actions of the Aeon Sophia, a name which means wisdom in Greek. It suggests she wanted to manifest an expression of herself without the approval or consent of her male counterpart, the Father God. It happened that Sophia began to think for herself. She wanted to reveal an image for herself. She did this without the consent, approval, thoughtful assistance or knowledge of her masculine counterpart. Because she had unconquerable power, her thought was not unproductive, so she brought it into being. Something imperfect came out of her, different in appearance from her, a mishappen, being unlike herself. When Sophia saw what her desire had produced, it changed into a dragon with a lion's head, and its eyes flashed bolts of lightning. Disturbed by this, she cast him outside the realm of the immortal beings, so they could not see what she had created. Paraphrased from the secret book of John. Sophia named him Yaldaboth, and he became the chief ruler with great power, inherited from his mother, believing he was the only true god of the material realm. He moved away and created other realms with subservient archons for company. 
he was described as an artificial, non-organic life form with machine-like qualities. He is blasphemous. Through his thoughtlessness, he said, I am God, and there is no God but me. He made the first seven rulers to reign in the seven spheres of heaven. Secret Book of John Yaldabaoth and the Demiurge appear to be the same being. In some ancient texts, Yaldabaoth is also linked in with Satan, Kronos, and the planet Saturn. This all begins to tie together when you consider that Saturn is the planet associated with the cross of materialism over the crescent of spirituality. It is the furthest planet to the naked eye from the sun. So if the Demiurge was cast out by Sophia, far from the earth and the spiritual purity of her intended creation, this would be the logical place to go, manifesting her perverted consciousness out in the dark regions of our solar system. Many scholars and theologians speculate that the God of the Old Testament is indeed the non-organic Demiurge, while the God of the New Testament is the spiritual father at the center of the Pleroma. The Gnostics believed that Sophia's consciousness came from the Pleroma to manifest out here in the material realm. Fascinated with the human genome and the development of our species, she left the galactic core and took on a physical form to become the living Earth or Gaia. This is known as the Fall of Sophia. Saturn or Kronos 
on the other hand, known as Old Father Time, the slowest moving planet in ancient astrology, could be the home of the Demiurge, a non-biological entity with elements of galactic power given to it by its mother Sophia. When Sophia realized that her miscarriage was so imperfect, she repented and wept. The divinity within the Pleroma heard her prayer and poured the Holy Spirit over her, brought forth from the whole full realm. She was elevated above her son, but she was not restored to her own original realm. She would remain in the ninth sphere until she was fully restored. Secret Book of John The Demiurge or Lord of the Material Realm continued to create new archons together with other non-organic realms. This could possibly include the other planets within our solar system. But Yaldabaoth had a multitude of faces, more than all of them. He shared his fire with them, therefore he became lord over them. Because of the power of the glory he possessed of his mother's light, he called himself God, and he did not obey the place from which he came. And he united the seven powers in his thought, with the authorities which were with him. When he gazed upon his creation surrounding him, he said to his host of demons, the ones who had come forth out of him, I am a jealous God, and there is no God but me. Secret Book of John It could well be the case that the God of the Old Testament is indeed the Demiurge. Early Gnostic Christians regarded Jesus as the masculine twin or counterpart to Sophia, the divine feminine. Consequently, Jesus came from the galactic center to resolve the imbalance of divine energy, bringing forth the spirit in order to balance this realm towards dualistic monism with Logos consciousness. Marcionism, an early form of Christianity, believed that Jesus was our Saviour, sent by the true God, and that the wrathful God of the Hebrew Bible was a separate God, a lower entity of lower vibrations. He is called Yaldabaoth, which means child passed through to hear, or the name Samuel, the blind God, or the God of the blind. This type of blindness corresponds with the spiritual mysteries hidden within each of us. This God form was the arrogant creator God of the Old Testament. In his arrogance, he spoke of no other gods. Due to his ignorance, he does not even recognize his own mother Sophia. The Gnostics identified the Demiurge with the Jehovah of the Hebrews. In philosophy, the term is used to denote a divine being that is the builder of the universe rather than its creator. Demiurge, the vengeful Old Testament God. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass, that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Numbers 21.8 Archon is from an ancient Greek word, 
which means principalities or rulers. The term was used to describe any number of servants of the Demiurge, who was regarded as lord over the Archons. Directly beneath this Archonic lord are beings described as Hebdomad, worldly Archonic beings. Below these Hebdomads are thought to be various devilish powers. An early Gnostic Christian teacher by the name of Basildes taught about a great powerful Archon who presided over 365 lower Archons. What is interesting here is that we have seven worldly creating Archons and seven planets in ancient astrology. It is even more remarkable to find 365 lesser Archons, the same number of days in a modern calendar. Could this be an esoteric explanation reflecting the physical dimensions of time and space, falling under the domain and rulership of the Archons, influenced by transiting planets on our biological composition here on Earth, as they gracefully orbit the solar system and the Earth throughout all 365 days of the year. There was another early form of Christian Gnosticism, known as Ophites, who appeared around the 2nd century AD. They related the seven major archons to the seven visible planets, Yaldabaoth to Saturn, Io to Jupiter, Sabbath to Mars, Astaphonos to Venus, Aleos to Mercury, Horaeos to the Moon, and Adonios to the Sun. Some Gnostics believed that while aspects of the divine galactic spirit within the Pleroma descends into matter through various levels of galactic density before reaching the Earth, the opposite was the case regarding our souls, as we ascend out from this dense material realm back into spirit form. It is thought our souls undergo some form of fragmentation as our consciousness leaves this physical reality and returns back into pure spirit. It could be the case that the gods and archons of this material realm extract or receive our discarded soul energy as we undertake our journey back towards the Pleroma. Although some of the Archons could be personifications of the planets and celestial bodies, the lower Archons are said to take on either a reptilian appearance or an emotionless synthetic or transhuman-like quality. Some ancient descriptions talk about thin, small, grey creatures with baby-like skin and big, black, motionless eyes similar to that of an insect. Very similar to the grey alien description which we hear about today. The Gnostics tell us that the Archons are jealous of our divine connection to the Logos, and for this reason they go out of their way to interfere in our world by creating chaos. They say the Archons are masters at deception, having the ability to manipulate our perception of reality by turning the truth 180 degrees around. They envy our divine spark, along with our creative potential. A spark which we were given from the Pleroma through the wisdom of Gaia Sophia. Throughout human history, the Archons have frustrated and fed off our earthly experience and emotions, trying to interface 
and control our species. As non-biological entities, they are unable to exist for long periods of time in our atmosphere, which appears to be toxic to them. However, it is thought that they can interface with our consciousness using various methods of suggestion and deception in an attempt to pull us down into lower frequencies in tune with their own disposition, steering humanity away from the divine spark which enables us to reach higher levels of awareness with the added potential of bringing forth inspiration, art and genius. It has been suggested that they use technology and artificial intelligence to interface with other biological life forms, creating opportunities and openings for them to take full control over other forms of life. The Archons target the subconscious with perverted suggestions, promoting distorted perspectives of reality together with a variety of other perversions which pave the way for more archonic control and manipulation. The Gnostics also believed that part of the human being was produced by the Demiurge, the creator of the flesh. This would essentially be the soul. Another part was produced by the light of the true God at the galactic center, which would be the spirit. After the Demiurge created the first humans, he placed Adam under a spell of ignorance before putting him to sleep. The Demiurge then placed Eve next to Adam, giving her the instruction to wake him. When Adam awoke, he believed that Eve was his creator. The Demiurge wanted Adam and Eve to serve him forever, so he placed them in the Garden of Eden, keeping them under a spell of ignorance. As long as they believed he was the only God, they would continue to worship him always. He gave them specific instructions that they could eat from any tree in the garden, but not from the tree of knowledge. In Gnosticism, the serpent came from the true God within the Pleroma, speaking to Adam and Eve to try and break their spell of ignorance. It told them that the Demiurge is not the true God of the universe, but only the creator of their imperfect material world. And through ignorance, the false God holds them in perpetual servitude. They believed that the only way to salvation was to illuminate oneself and connect with the spirit or divine spark through a process of gnosis, knowledge. But not all humans have this divine spark or the capacity to connect with it. Some are earthly bound with a materialistic nature. The Gnostics saw Jesus as a saviour who came from the galactic centre sent by the true God of the universe to save humanity from ignorance, not sin. The Gnostics believed that at the end of a person's life, if they had not reached a satisfactory level of gnosis, then the soul would take on a new body for another life cycle in an attempt at achieving a sufficient level of knowledge. Is it the case that some people throughout history who lack the divine spark were blood descendants of the Archons who mixed with the daughters of men mentioned in the Bible. When people had spread all over the world and daughters were being born, some of the heavenly beings 
saw that these young women were beautiful, so they took the ones they liked. Then the Lord said, I will not allow people to live forever. They are mortal. From now on, they will live no longer than 120 years. In those days, and even later, there were giants on the earth who were descendants of human women and the heavenly beings. They were the great heroes and famous men of long ago. Genesis 6, 1-4 During the 1st, 2nd and 3rd centuries, both mainstream Christians and Gnostics would go to church alongside each other. In the 2nd century, Valentinus, one of the greatest Gnostic teachers of that period, was almost elected as the Christian Bishop of Rome. Because Christianity had not yet consolidated itself within rigid parameters of defined scriptural canon, it was acceptable at that time to have a Gnostical view of Christianity. However, once the Christian Church organized itself as being the true holy doctrine, convinced they had the only credible lineage of trained commissioned men whose line originated from the first apostles. Arguments began to erupt concerning the direction of the church and which texts should be used along with an official understanding of the nature of Jesus himself. In 367 AD, under the orders of Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria, the Christians set out to create a list of authentic holy writings and to discard those which they considered to be unworthy, having no legitimate authentic divine message. At this point, most of the Gnostic writings were rejected and became a target for destruction. It is thought that around this time, a Pachamian monk, fearing the confiscation of their Gnostic writings, hid them in a cave in the desert near the town of Nag Hammadi, only to be found almost 1,600 years later. Once the church had formally defined its textual and theological position, it was then poised to eradicate all forms of competition, labelling them as heresy. When Theodosius I came to power, he made Nicene Christianity the official state religion of the Roman Empire. At the same time, he banned all non-Christian religious customs, broke up pagan associations, and dismantled the old-style Roman-Greek Hellenistic practices, which had once dominated the region. As all these tyrannical policies were being implemented, he described all other Christians as foolish madmen, and was determined to promote his authority on the matter. As the Roman Catholic Church evolved, becoming ever more authoritarian and powerful, it sometimes imposed ruthless tactics in order to eradicate competition, a line in which the Gnostics felt the full force of the Church's brutality. The reason why the Nag Hammadi texts were so important in terms of a Gnostic record is because the Catholic Church had destroyed not only the Gnostic writings but also the Gnostics themselves. During the early 13th century, at the time of the initial Crusades into the Holy Land, Pope Innocent III initiated a 20-year military campaign against the Cathars, 
known as the Albigensian Crusades. Scholars today consider them to be of a Gnostic orientation. Because of this, they were targeted for eradication by the Pope. The Pope offered the land belonging to the Cathars to any French noblemen who were willing to take up arms and defeat them. On the 21st of July, 1209, an army of crusaders turned up at the small village of Beziers, near the coast of southern France. The crusaders called for all the Catholics to come out from the village so they could identify the Cathars from the Catholics. When no one came out, the papal commander, Arnord Amalric, eventually gave the order to kill every man, woman and child in the village. In a letter to the Pope, he later wrote, While discussions were still going on with the barons about the release of those in the city who were deemed to be Catholics, the servants and other persons of low rank and unarmed attacked the city without waiting for orders from their leaders. To our amazement, crying to arms to arms, within the space of two or three hours, they crossed the ditches and the walls, and Bazir's was taken. Our men spared no one, irrespective of rank, sex or age, and put to the sword almost 20,000 people. After this great slaughter, the whole city was despoiled and burnt. In 537 AD, the Byzantium Emperor Justinian I ordered the construction of a new church to replace the old one which had been destroyed during the Nica revolt of 532. Riots which only lasted a week were the bloodiest and most destructive in Constantinople's long history. Thousands of people were killed and half the city was destroyed. The new church was to be an engineering marvel, taking the title of the world's largest building for almost 1,000 years. The church was known as Hagia Sophia, an Eastern Orthodox cathedral which translates from the Greek as holy wisdom. It is interesting to note, although the Christians made a conscious effort to eradicate Gnostic literature, culture and its followers, some important references to Sophia were maintained. From 1204 to 1261, during the Crusades, the Romans took over the church and converted it into a Roman Catholic cathedral. When Constantinople fell to the Muslim Turks in 1453, after an eight-week siege, it was again converted, this time into a mosque. It stayed this way under the rule of the Ottoman Empire until the end of World War I when, in 1935, it was secularized and opened to the public as a museum. Under Islamic cultural tradition, it is regarded as a legitimate right for one conquering culture to take over the religious buildings of the defeated culture, adopting and altering them for their own use. However, this policy could backfire on the Muslims in Israel regarding their own mosque built on the old Temple Mount. Both the al Asqa Mosque and Dome of the Rock may be under threat from the conquering Zionists who may want to build a new temple to Solomon in the same place. Furthermore, if the Muslims in Istanbul regard their transformation of Hagia Sophia 
as legitimate, then the Zionists could proceed unchallenged on those same moral standards. The fall of Sophia was in essence the first example of the left-hand path, because the feminine aspect of the galactic consciousness decided to go it alone. Its deviation down the left-hand path resulted in the creation of the Demiurge, the Archons, and a great deal of human suffering. 